Good morning, church. Good morning, everybody watching online. My name is Eric. I'm on the Decided Church leadership team, and it is an honor and a privilege to be before you today uh, to deliver the message. We're in week two of our grab bag series. Uh, Jim started off with a powerful message. Um, I'm on. I can hear myself over the monitor. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, yeah, what a powerful uh, set of worship that we just went to. I don't know if y'all noticed, but I was back there. I got so loose. I got so in the spirit that I dropped my sticks three times. That's a first. That's never happened before. If y'all missed it, go back and watch that last song that we just did because uh, it, was, it was probably hilarious, but nothing's going to take away my joy. It was good stuff. I was, I was so into it. I was feeling it. It was a great call to worship. Amanda um, led us in uh, today. We are going to be diving into the word in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 13. And uh, the reason that I uh, selected this text was um, just because I feel like the book of Ecclesiastes um, is written by King Solomon. Um, I just feel like it's a real uh, down-to-earth, uh, real-deal book. Um, I think it's an important book for um, any Christian, especially like a new Christian, uh, to, to dig into um, if they've never dug into the Bible before. Um, and so let's go ahead and begin in verse 1. Verse 1 says, For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under the sun, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Now in verse 9, this is our God-given task. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. Nothing is better for them to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. That is God's gift to man. What does this text tell me? Well, the author of this text had everything. Uh, King Solomon, he was very rich. He had many wives and he had many possessions. Yet it sounds to me like his rhetoric is uh, kind of contrasts um, Proverbs. In Proverbs, it tells us that we prosper from our good works. But here in Ecclesiastes, uh, King Solomon suggests that we are certainly not judged by our good works. But that we should eat and drink and rejoice and be merry uh, in our work. The book of Ecclesiastes is a reminder that with all our work that we do to maintain control with our timeline, in the end, God is in perfect control. And his plan will always and has always reign supreme. I'm going to jump, uh, jump to verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into every man's heart, yet so that he could not find out what God has done from beginning to the end. 
God gave us the ability to view his own world. But we can never completely understand everything that he does. Yet he does everything at exactly the right time. God has a perfectly timed out plan for you. Um, I mean, verse 1 of this text that, uh, that I went over earlier, um, it it's spoke to me a lot. It's a simple verse. It's a very simple verse. I'll, um, I'll read it again. It says, everything that, uh, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Very easy to grasp. Plants bloom and wither with the uh, changing of the temperatures. Um, animals lose their antlers. Some animals go into hibernation uh, one part of the year. Brings hurricanes and tropical depressions. Another part of the year brings us drought. And it's so important to remember that we're all in some sort of season. Whether it be a season of trial, a season of waiting, um, a season of rest. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 gives us a list of things to expect in whatever season that we may find ourselves in. I'm going to read them off again because as, uh, as, I, as I read through them, it's, it's like, I just, I, it's almost like I just needed to hear it, you know. It's like I just, I needed to hear that um, there is a time to stay silent, um, it does say it does say there is a time to hate, but there's a time to hate evil, you know. Um, so I'm just going to read these these off again for us: a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pick up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love. A time to hate. A time for war. And a time for peace. There is a really good chance that all of these circumstances, all of these times that King Solomon listed, there is a there is a high chance that you will find yourself in a season where you experience one of those things, if not all of them. If not all of them. The question is, are you prepared? Is your heart in the right position? What is the condition of your heart when it comes to a time to love or a time to hate? A time for war or a time for peace? What is the position of your heart? Are you prepared? One thing that's always blown my mind with God's timing is the way that the big C church seems to be synced up. I don't know if anybody else has no, like, noticed that. Um, it, like when we switch themes or uh we change uh the look of our church it just seems like uh, there's a church over in houston there's a church up in charlotte uh there's a church up in indianapolis like like all doing like the pallet wall thing it's like how did that happen like our, we we weren't communicating with other churches it just seems like the holy spirit just synced us up uh god's timing is like that that's just how it is um this year our theme happens to be joy. What a year for such a theme, right? In 2020, like how? Like how? How am I supposed to maintain an attitude that brings about joy? It's difficult. I mean, I think this, this year, 2020, has really put people to the test. And as I sat down to prepare this, uh, this message, I just, 
just thought about the insane world that we live in. The enemy has brought about division of biblical proportions. The enemy has brought about division of biblical proportions. I've never seen a time where the people are more divided than they are right now. And in, so, in order to get this message across, I singled out one thing that none of us like. Monday. Who out there, who out there hates Monday? I see everybody's hand except for Jim's and, oh, Jeremy, you like Mondays. That's cool. Oh, never mind. He doesn't like Mondays. It's by far the easiest day of the week to throw shade on for most of us, depending on your schedule. It's the end of the weekend. It's the beginning of the rut. And even the Internet hates on Monday. Y'all seen those memes? Like if Monday was a person and it shows like that character from AMC, Negan, holding like Lucille. Like if Monday was a person or like if Monday was a, a, a Christmas present uh, and it features like a, like a fruitcake or like a pair of socks or something. Like, nobody wants that. for Nobody wants Monday, you know? Y'all seen those memes? I know y'all have. It's easy to hate on Monday. But does it really make Monday any better? It's easy to hate on Monday. But does it make Monday any better? It's easy to hate on the mundane. The mundane. I know that my Monday doesn't look like everybody else's Monday, but if you hate Monday, I encourage you to set your sights on Monday. I encourage you to set your sights on Monday. Well, how does that look? Well, preparation goes a long way. You could set your alarm, which you probably already do, or better yet, you could set your timer on your coffee pot. You know what I'm saying? That way when your alarm goes off, that you, you always set your alarm. That way when your alarm goes off, you smell the coffee, and you can get up out of bed, and you can go get yourself a cu cup of coffee. Uh, that will help you wake up a little bit so that when you return to your closet, you're, you're able to uh, decide what you want to wear a little easier. Or better yet, you could set your clothes out the night before. Phone, wallet, keys, all in a central designated location. There are things that you can do to make your Monday the best that it can possibly be. God has a plan for your life, yeah? Why are so many of us guilty of thinking that Mondays weren't in God's plan? Why are so many of us guilty of thinking that for some reason Mondays just weren't in God's plan? For some reason, we go about our idea of his plan aimlessly, like we're running through the woods at night with no flashlight. The enemy gets his foot in the door when we have that kind of attitude. The enemy gets his foot in the door. We need to intentionally set our sights on what our next step is. And to intentionally set our sights... It's going to require us to intentionally strive to grow. And when the enemy has his foot in the door, growth seems impossible. Maybe because you attempted to grow in a certain area and you failed, or you think you're just going to fail. Growth might seem... Uh, embarrassing because 
growing people change, and you're scared that people are going to see you change. And one of, the th- one of the things that the enemy loves to use as a tactic is make growth seem unnecessary. That's one of his favorite tools, to make growth seem unnecessary. That's a lie. It is necessary. You're just in your comfort zone. You're just in your comfort zone. If, that, if, if you believe that growth is unnecessary, let's face it, you're in your comfort zone and you're scared to leave it. There is absolutely growth outside of your comfort zone and don't ever believe that lie. When you think about growth and the first thing you think about is your shortcomings, that's great. You should think about your shortcomings. You should go ahead and write them down. Because you're going to need a plan to attack them. If the first thing that you think about when you think of growth is your flaws, it could be bitterness. It could be resentment. Uh, resentment is a very easy trap to fall into. Anytime you pull up social media uh, and, you, and you're scrolling and you see um, a, a picture of somebody you know who's always on vacation, um, it's easy to begin to compare your life to theirs. Or you, or you might uh, see somebody who is um, succeeding uh, more than you perceive your life. And it could cause, like, resentment. Resentment is a very easy trap to fall into. When you go about your idea of his plan for your life, aimlessly, aimlessly, like you're trying to shoot a basketball with your eyes closed. The devil's got to drop on you. And if that's you, I want to tell you something. You have an entire world that's ready to open up for you. If that's you, you have got an entire world that's ready and will open up for you. It requires a shift in attitude. It requires intentionality to set your sights on what your next step is. Everybody's got a next step. You've got to consider that. You've got to consider what your next step is. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, that we're God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So is it a shortcoming or are you just short-sighted? I mean, I've, I've, I've definitely been there before. I've definitely been short-sighted. Like, I don't see what's in front of me. Like, I feel like I don't have to take a next step. Or I know my next step and I avoid it because I'm afraid of what people will think. Uh, for example, um, my next step was, was baptism once. And I had already been serving for a while, you know. I would already been leading for a while. And I was afraid that if I signed up and and got baptized, uh, like like I should, um, that people were going to see that, like, oh, my gosh. Like, I was, he wasn't even baptized yet. Like, who cares? Who cares? And the entire time that I put off signing up for my baptism, it, it literally like kept me awake at night. Like, God spoke to me in ways that like I really didn't like hearing about like what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? And it's like, ah, you know what? I don't know. Um, that season finally came to a close when I finally signed up and got baptized. Surprise, surprise. Like, when you're in a season, like, your season is supposed to come to a completion. Like, we're supposed to go through different seasons. We're supposed to take next steps. We serve a God 
who is the most intentional in the way that he made us, in the way that he made our surroundings, and in the way that he goes before us. And when we're intentional about what's important as well as the mundane, you experience growth. Then you experience growth that overflows into your family. And then you experience more growth that starts to overflow into your community. Like, that's true. Like, I'm a walking example of that. I never thought, never thought that I would ever be able to do the things that God's always called me to. Never did. I want to experience everything. I want to experience everything that God has set up for me and my family. In December of 2019, just three months after we brought home our baby boy from the hospital in Savannah, my wife and I were made aware of a construction company in Nashville, Tennessee, that wanted my company to come and be a part of a new construction project in the city. How in the world am I supposed to be intentional in a season of uncertainty? We can pray. I think that's the only way to be intentional in a season of uncertainty is we can pray. And we did pray. And we got pretty specific in prayer. And you know, it was when we it was when it was when we started to pray against it that everything just kind of like opened up for us. Like I saw a path that I didn't want to take because I started to think about my son. And then I started thinking about our adoption and how hard it was. It was de- there was definitely trial in that season. And it would have just been so much easier. It would have just been so much easier to just skip it just skip that calling but now I can't imagine a life without that sweet man Maverick I don't want to know what it's like to take the easy route I want to experience all of it he's been so good to us He's been a very intentional Heavenly Father. And in about six months, Amanda and I are going to be packing up a U-Haul and we're going to be planting our roots in the city of Nashville. And I, I don't necessarily know all that God has in store for us there, but what I do know is that it's immeasurably more than Amanda and I combined can imagine. When the Lord brought us to Irma, he called us to this incredible church. Not just to help build it, but he called us here to expose our gifts and our talents He called us here to build relationships that are going to last all of our lives. Friendships that we never thought that we could have. That run deep, that have roots that can't be pulled up. He called us here to help make ready the church to come. 
where Christ is at the center and the body is encouraged and built up around it to endure everything that this world has to throw at us. And I'm a firm believer that the first half of 2020 was just a primer. I feel like the second half of this year is we're, we're going to see what real division looks like. And for us, for this body, I know that we were made for this. I know without a shadow of a doubt that we were made for every single thing that's coming. God designed us, and he put us here, and he put people around us, and he may take people away, but there's no doubt in my mind that we're prepared, that we're ready for this. And so, church, as we move forward, I ask that you start with your Mondays. Start with your Mondays. Be intentional about making every day the best that it can be. Be intentional about seeing and hearing and knowing everything that God is directing you towards. And if we can just do that, we're going to be fine this year. And I'm going to call the worship team up, and I'm going to pray for us. And we're going to send the rest of this service up and worship for everything that God's done, for everything that God is going to continue to do. And Amanda and I are going to finish this year. We're going to finish it well. We're going to do everything in our power. We're going to do everything that we can. We're going to not let up. You know, like senioritis, like when you're, when you're a senior in high school, you just kind of want to, like, check out. Well, Amanda and I refuse to do that. It's, it's, uh, it's not an option for us. So, church, if you would, stand, uh, and we'll get some worship going to finish off this service. Um, I'm going to pray first, and we'll continue in praise. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much uh, for this message that, uh, that you've brought to the table. Father, I just thank you for uh, the revelations that, um, that you've brought forth um, in my life. And, Father, I just pray that we can go forward this week, that we can start our week o- weeks off so strong that they finish strong. Heavenly Father, I pray for um, our church body. Um, I pray for uh, this virus to just die and go away. I pray for this virus to go away. Um, I pray for an opportunity for us to all gather again. Um, And Father, I thank you. We pray this in your name. Amen.